Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Cold Hard Truth NFL podcast. I'm your host, Anish Gupta. And I'm your host, Shrikar Rajendran. Uh, we're back. Uh, I don't think we ended up uploading the week four. Uh, Wait, what? Oh, you didn't episode. upload it? I don't think so. Oh. I was flooded with midterm, so apologies. Um, but it's okay. Bra- or week five, I think, was the episode. But yeah, the Browns were on a bye anyway, so like obviously no one cares uh, about football when the Browns don't play. So uh, we're back. I think that's when Browns. everyone starts to care about football. <laughs> um, but now nah, we're back, um, and uh, we'll we'll get into it a little bit, but. Uh, for those who don't know about the upcoming matchups, this is the first time the Niners and the Browns have matched up ever on the pod, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll save a little bit for when we talk about it, but we'll just jump into the Niners uh, real quick. So obviously the, the biggest game that most people were anticipating, Niners-Cowboys, ended up being a 42-10 to 10 win. Um, I remember, oh, see, we don't even have it out on YouTube, but when we did talk about the picks, uh, there was a co-host in particular that said, Niners by a bill, this was going to be an easy Niners win. You say that every week. But what has it been for the last five weeks? It's been just Niners win by a lot, and that's why on our topic sheet- You did this last Niners, season too. I literally wrote, Niners are unstoppable, like, and because that's what they are. And since week seven of last year, they have been. And yeah, they are unstoppable. I'm going to keep saying Niners by a billion till I'm wrong. Um, and I, I, you know, I've just been thinking about it a lot lately. And I'll kind of jump right into it, right? Like, why are they so unstoppable? You could mention the fact that they've got like five to six guys that are top three at their position. You could mention the fact that, you know, guys just get wide open. Like, and as much as I, you know, like to diss Kyle Shanahan and throw a little jabs, I can't deny the fact that he's a great play caller. Like he is a really good coach. Um, And I think this is, this is a really good job that he's doing. Um, You know, not to like, it's also that he has some really great players, like, you know, so. That he helped develop. Like like he bought the team. Like a lot of, so, I mean, I think it's really tough to say, you know, why SF is so good. I think like a big part of that though, is that Brock Purdy is getting paid less than a mil. The fact that you can keep all these guys on a high payroll, everyone's happy, right? Because, you know, no one has to have a personality when they're all getting paid, right? Like everybody's getting paid their exact amount that they should be earning, right? Fred, uh, Kittle, Trent, Bosa, Debo are all getting paid what they should be. And then I believe Ayuk's contract is coming up. So, and they can still afford to get him done, right? Um, you've got guys like Dre Greenlaw, you know, Eric Armstead who know their role, right? And are playing exactly to it. And Eric got his top dollar all those years ago, right? Like two, three years back. So, you know, payroll wise, they've been great. And, you know, the system is working perfectly. And they're just such a well-oiled machine that you can't really get to. I mean, it's it's like CMC is getting untouched till the second level. And, you know, Ayuk and Debo are literally getting five to 10 yards of separation on any route that's outside the hashes. Like it, it's, you know, Dallas, I think obviously got dismantled and everyone's going to say, oh, you know, they're completely done. They're a good team. They just really match up bad with SF. And if you already match up bad with SF going into it, one, they, yeah, they're out. It was a bad matchup. And two, they just got completely outclassed, right? On all three phases. So, you know, that's to kind of touch on the game, but just in general, the Niners, I think, have the most deep roster, right? They have a great play caller. They have a quarterback who's accurate and gets the ball in perfect spots. I don't think there's been a single game where you can say Brock Purdy let him down. That's why they're undefeated. Um, But I will throw you this final thought, and I'll let you maybe uh, take this and start with it and then go into what you think. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Brock Purdy, right, who uh, I've, you know, I've been a big fan of, He's only trailed in the fourth quarter for a grand total of three minutes. So that is the one thing we have not seen from him. And that is the one thing that I think could get in their way, right? Like that's the one thing we just have not seen the Niners do, right? And you never know, January football, when it gets tight, right? What do they look like when they're down? Because they can run the ball, right? And they can get you off play action. But a lot of teams defining moments are what happens if you're down 10 with 11 minutes left. How do you get back in the ball game and win it? And I'll let you maybe transition, answer that. And uh, yeah, that that's I, really all I have to say about the Niners. I understand that specific scenario, but if we go back to the Cowboys game in the divisional, like that was still a close game that Purdy ultimately had to like get out of. Like that that play to Kittle, right? Obviously, great catch by Kittle, like that was unbelievable. But 
he still had to make the play and he still had to get the offense rolling eventually. And he did. Uh, and even the Raiders game last year, regular season, obviously lower stakes. So I don't like to mention that right after the Cowboys game, but even then that was a shootout with Jared Stidham of all people, but he still found a way to pull through. So I'm not really, I'm not really questioning Brock until like January, February football. Yes, I agree. But he's shown me that he can be poised in those situations and he's shown that he can keep the offense rolling uh, in high pressure scenarios like that. But yeah, I'll, I'll comment a little bit on uh, you're talking about the money thing. I a hundred percent agree. It's, it's literally because Purdy's getting paid less than a mil. Um, Ayuk is going to be due for an extension. Hufanga is going to be due for an extension. I think Dre Greenlaw is going to be the one that we have to let go. Mm-hmm. Uh, Great. Just because he's already he's already on a steal of a contract, by the way. I mean, that contract's unbelievable. I think we signed him two seasons ago. Uh, it was like two years, eight mil, I think. I mean, that's yeah, like, high, highway Drake, robbery. Drake, Drake um, Jackson, too, in a couple of years, maybe, right? Because while everyone's still on the payroll, you might have to get him. Well, who knows with his development now that you bring in Randy Gregory, who's another piece that we didn't even get to talk about. So yeah. um, I thought I thought that trade was also excellent in itself. Uh, I like bringing Randy Gregory into this D-line. Chris Kostrick should have a great time with him in the fold as well. Uh, but yeah, if Drake Jackson ends up showing a lot, then maybe he could be thrown into consideration. That's pretty far down the line. Um, but yeah, in terms of like imminent extensions, if you're going to have to make the choice between Ayuk and Hufanga, I, that's going to be a tough, tough decision to make. I think Dre is pretty much out of the, I think he's going to get a lot of money from another team. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think financially, they're always able to make it work, and they've done it once again this year. I'll talk about the game a little bit. I think the Niners just continue to prove their dominance, right? This is the clear-cut best team in football right now. Other teams, other teams kind of slip up around this point or at least in one game the Niners haven't slipped up at all like they have literally been like nearly flawless every single game I can um, think of maybe eight minutes like in that Rams game that I thought they looked vulnerable yeah. that's it that that's, and that's literally honestly it. honestly and that was pretty much the defense because they Steve yeah. Wilkes was just playing all his corners back for whatever reason and Puka Nakua was getting open in the middle and Stafford was able to work but the offense mainly has just been flawless like and I'll talk about this a little bit. I say this pretty much every episode since the season started with various different teams. The Niners have an, an endless amount of ways to win. Now, usually when I say this about a team, it's like, yeah, you can win with the pass. You can win with the run. You can win with the defense. There are so many different ways that the Niners could beat you. Yeah, pass game, run game, defense, but also like turnovers. They can make plays there. Super tight in coverage. Like CD Lamb was locked up for the better part of that game. Um, they can stop the run. I mean, even on offense, they can just drain teams. Like they can score quick or they can go on a long drive and just straight up like out physical you the whole, the whole game. Like they can choose what they want to do on every drive and it's going to work. Right. So again, I usually say that a team can win a variety of ways and normally it's like three ways, but the Niners have so many different ways that they can beat you. Uh, McCaffrey was dominant. He's been dominant all season. Uh, I, I think he is an MVP candidate. I feel super confident saying that, even if it's a running back, I think he definitely deserves to be in the convo. Uh, George Kittle, great game. Finally, finally, if you have George Kittle in fantasy, that was the game. Uh, <laughs> again, this is the best team in football. I have nothing to complain about. If you're wondering why I haven't been talking about the Niners that much on previous episodes, it's because literally what, what do I have to say? Yeah. Um, I, unlike Raheem Mostert, I will agree with you. McCaffrey should be an MVP candidate. Um, uh, that, that aged terribly. And, um, yeah, and about Brock, okay, I, I think I've only counted the McCaffrey fumble as the only offensive turnover. Uh, I might be missing another fumble here and there, but I know Brock hasn't thrown a pick. Yeah, so, he hasn't thrown a pick. Like, think about how, like, they just don't make mistakes, right? You wait, like, the Rams made a couple in that third quarter, right, which, which is what cost them the game. Uh, and I'll retaliate with what you talked about in, with Brock in the playoffs. Um, I think Dallas lost that game more than the Niners won it. I believe they had a turnover in plus territory, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, like, like the Niners, every game that they've played aside from that, I think they've won. They flat out won. It hasn't been the other team, like, kind of choking it. It's just been them, like, outplaying you on either offensively or defensively or both, right? And um, 
dude, I, I just like, I'm looking at their schedule and every, cause obviously, you know, we're both from the Bay. Every, like a lot of my friends are Niners fans. They all think I'm trying to jinx them. Like even Shrikar, I not try, like, I'm just telling you the truth. I really do not see, like, I, I, you know, people will bring up Philly, they'll bring up Baltimore, they'll even bring up Jacksonville. I think all three of those teams, like the Niners match up perfectly with like damn near every team. The Chiefs don't have a receiver that can, you know, push you to outside. Like corners, what I would maybe say is the kind of weakness, but you saw with CD Lamb, they just bracketed him off and you have cover linebackers that can get up there. So like they're like to really beat them, I think Philly is the only team that kind of, and Miami, right? But they don't play Miami, so great. And Philly is the only team that maybe kind of matches up well with them. But, um, you know, their corners are also a little bit of a weak spot. So, like, you know, it's it's really a tale of which receivers will kind of get there at the end of the day. And that's why I think that matchup will probably be, you know, the biggest telling test. But really, I think the Niners are just going to cruise the January football. And I think that's where we're going to really see kind of a test. But, I mean, seriously, dude, th- this is just such a well-crafted roster. And I think that really starts from that 2017 rebuild where they've just been kind of accumulating slowly these players, right? Kind of orchestrating it the right way. And, uh, you know, just a hell of a job. Uh, that's I think- one more thing. One more thing I want to point up. You talk about that rebuild. We got to talk about the amount of like blessings in disguise that the Niners have gotten. 2018, Jimmy tears his ACL. We end up with Bosa in that draft because we're bad enough to get the number two pick. The whole Trey Lance fiasco, that's that's over with, but you get Brock Purdy out of it. I mm-hmm. mean, this team, like, it's 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 lucky. Like, it's lucky, but it's yeah. like, I'm so I happy. Like, I don't think people realize how insane it is that your starting quarterback is getting paid $900,000. Let, yeah. me, let me just put this in perspective. First round pick quarterbacks are getting paid 10 mil, yeah. okay? And this guy is out here out-dueling all of them and getting paid 900k i know software engineers that are making more than 900k like that is the, you know what which honestly kind of sucks for brock because if he wasn't taken with the last pick he would have gotten a lot more just I'm, it's free. okay he'll he'll get his he'll get his he'll, he'll he, get his yeah, he'll get his money now and yeah i mean i i think brock is awesome uh so poised i think i've been saying that since he kind of started for sf but yeah great great stuff all around uh, a team that's really not doing so great and does have a first round quarterback payroll, uh, the New England Patriots. It's <sighs> maybe I'll, I'll let you I'll let you start because I, I do want to talk a little bit about the Pats because they've just been on my radar every like everywhere for the last few days, especially with you know that debacle of a game in uh, against New Orleans. Uh, yeah, it's just all around bad. Like the Pats, the Pats are terrible. I knew this team wouldn't have the best record because of the schedule, but. Like, I thought they'd at least be better than this, right? I, I, I'm i sure you did too. Um, it's just a ton of holes. You need a QB. I'd say the O-line, aside from like one to two players, is bad. Uh, receiver's bad. They can't run. Ramondre Stevenson doesn't even look nearly the same as last year. And Zeke obviously isn't helping things. <laughs> I mean, they'll be fine defensively just because Belichick is still a great defensive coach. I can never take that away from him. So I think on defense, they'll be all right. But I mean, they're definitely worse than we thought. Like the Pats are not good. I thought they were kind of equal to the Saints on paper and then they get spanked by the Saints. So, I mean, that sums it all up. Just it's kind of a lost year for the Pats at this point. Yeah, this is the first time in my life I can finally bet against the Pats comfortably. And like, I know Shriek's been kind of on this fence where Pats could get a top 10 pick for the last couple of years. I think you find like, this is finally the year to do it, right? Like this is yeah. just, and it's it sucks because it's tanking Bill Belichick's legacy. And look, I think, I mean, I'm a big quarterback guy, right? Like I've always been of that belief. But to say that, you know, it's like, like Belichick is not good or he needed Brady, I still will never understand that narrative. Like the way the Pats have won a lot of games, we're we're less than four years, or sorry, we're just over four years removed from the greatest defensive performance in the Super Bowl. Like, li- like, right? I mean, you held the highest scoring offense to three points. We're just four years removed from that. In reality, they needed each other. Yeah, exactly. And I think people are just losing sight of that now because of how bad they've looked. And I think that's because, yes, Bill Belichick as a GM has missed on a lot of stuff. So, you know, that like when he gets more power, fine. Yeah, he's missed on a lot of the players. But 
like a lot of the guys they find in late rounds have looked really good, right? Like, you know, Jamie Collins is a good example. Chandler Jones back in the day, right? Like, um, you know, JC Jack, like all these guys, they have like fines, right? Like it's been a thing throughout the decade. Um, and it sucks because you're right. It's a bad roster for one, right? And they have injuries now that's, you know, Christian Gonzalez, a guy who finally was looking good as a first round pick is now hurt, right? Their O-line, as you said, is terrible. They can't run the ball. And Mac Jones has like, it's it's just pathetic what I'm seeing. He sucks. But all, like it's it's but and and the thing is it's like it's a combination of both. Like it's there's no there's no bright side. It because it's like yeah Mac sure you can say his O line's been terrible and he's just not reading the field. But you can also say he's not reading the field right. So the Pats are just a mess and it's weird because the first two weeks right you genuinely could have said they could have beaten the Philadelphia Eagles and they could have beaten the Miami Dolphins right. I think there was both arguments in those games. And then it's just been a complete 180. Like, I think they've been outscored like 72 to six or something, 72 to three, right? Something crazy, yeah. Yeah, right. So um, now what do you do, right? Like, I think this would be a great spot for a guy like Caleb Williams, right? Like, I, I so, you know, if you're Robert Kraft, you're thinking, oh my God, I get one of those guys in New England with that market, right? Like, hey, Drake, you know, mate, Drake. People yeah, stop of, sleeping on Drake. Them. I mean, like, there's there's dead ass like four four or five guys that could be drafted in the first round, right? So I think for the Pats, it yeah, it is. I think we can sum it up as a lost season. There's just really no side of the ball or no exact unit that I really fear, aside from maybe their pass rush, right? I think that's their only thing that's pretty comp- comparable to you know a lot of the top guys in the league. But I mean, it, it's just crazy because I think, you know, f- for anybody who was born around where we were, right, or just honestly, anybody from like 2000 to 2006, right, around there, we have all grown up knowing this team to be, you know, just a surefire, you know, contender, a team that went to the AFC championship eight years in a row. Yeah, this team- this is foreign to us. Like, yeah, we, don't, this is, we don't understand right, this. Yeah. And this is like a team that, um, you know, would just – they would always play 10 o'clock game for Pacific time and would just be like, Oh, it's a Pats win. Right. Like you wouldn't even have to know, think about it. Um, So, you know, that's why I think this is such a big deal in the media now, because obviously it's the first time in 20 years, we can really say this, the the Pats are the laughing stock of an NFL season. Right. Maybe, you know, (laughs) that might be our title, (laughs) Um, but uh, yeah, that's, I'll kind of wrap it up there. Just, it's really crazy to think about. Never thought I'd see the day. Um, but yeah, well, I mean, do do you want to talk about Bill Belichick's status? Like, I really just don't like. I, I think, mean, I think, yeah, I I kind of agree that he's catching kind of like unnecessary flack here. Obviously, the job he's done this season isn't up to par, but that doesn't give you the right to talk about what he's done throughout his career and try and taint what he's done because what he's do done is what fired he's done. though. Like, do you think do you think he could get fired? Like, that's I, a I I don't see him getting fired. The only the only like. He would have to leave on his own terms. Like he's not, he's not getting fired by Robert Kraft. Like I just don't, yeah, I just don't think you can like, uh, and, and you know, New England media who's been trying this and saying this will obviously because Bill Belichick's been nothing short of mean to you over the 20 years. So yeah, any chance you could get to thrash him, you'd love to, but um, nah, man, I, I, I just can't see, you know, a scenario where that happens, but it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like when Jim Beheim left Syracuse, People obviously they had him on the hot seat. There was like calls for him to get fired and whatnot, but our athletic director was just not going to do that for someone as legendary to a program like Bill Belichick. Love it or hate it, like him and Brady are the faces of that team. Like they don't they don't get fired like that. There's no authority that's going to make them go out like that. They're going to go out when they want because they've earned it. So Agreed. I I just feel like that's the case with Belichick. He can't get fired. Agreed uh moving on uh i think we went from did goop curse t lot to is t law really that dude because the jags beat the bills and um it should have been a little bit more the score was not yeah. telling us what it was yes. like really yeah. dropped that or not dropped but it, again can we just get our feet in bounds fellas oh my like i think t law would literally have mvp numbers if their if their receivers knew that it's two feet not one like we're not in college okay like if they just had two feet in bounds i've literally counted four touchdowns on the year that we could add to t law stats um but nevertheless uh, I know you saw that third third down streak. I know the word. Like, I, I was gonna bring that up as my moment of the game, but I'll, I'll let you talk first. 
third and one, right? You need a first down to ice it or, well, they ended up going, you know, for that run and taking the two possession lead, but that throw to Calvin Ridley, like, this is what I mean when I talk about Trevor Lawrence. Like, this is what, why I'm so high on this dude. And sure, you can bring up all the talent of like other guys like Herb and Hertz and Lamar, but I don't think there's a flaw in T-Law's game. Like, I think he's he plays so well. And sure, fine, other guys can make that throw. But really, third and one for Dougie P to have the guts to do that. And for Trevor Lawrence to execute, like, I think that was like a 40-plus air yard throw, perfectly on the money. And great job for Cal- to Calvin for bringing it in. But uh, I, the Jags flat out outplayed the Bills, both sides of the ball. And this is this is the ceiling I had for them. Like, this is a team, this is what I have you know, kind of put them, this is the pedestal I've put them on, right? And they finally lived up to it in this game. Uh, I thought they would do that against Kansas City. I was, I, I honestly think if they got, they honestly did defensively. And then if they got those, you know, those catches and bounds probably would have beaten them. But like, this is what we're seeing. Like, and I think this is the biggest tell was also their Jack, the Jags defense. I think that was everyone's calling card, right? Yeah, we know Trevor Lawrence is going to be good, but can, can this be a championship caliber defense? I think it can be. And, you know, they've got guys like Tyson Campbell, who's an absolute dog, right? Darius Williams, who had that pick on Stephon Diggs, right? Really good complimentary piece. Um, You know, Trayvon Walker and Josh Allen are kind of doing their own thing over there. Uh, Devin Lloyd, who was my linebacker one in the draft. Uh, I'm just kind of naming names, but, you know, these guys are all really part of a collective unit that's been really good. Um, So I I think they finally lived up to that pedestal. I I never really took them off, but I was really considering it, right? Considering how they looked in the first four weeks, but I'm glad I, we kind of stuck with it. And um, I'll I'll kind of transition to you with a question, right? Am I still good? Are you still good to keep them on that same pedestal? Do you think they could still be that team that, you know, at least I've kind of had them to be? Um, and Which is, you know, where I have them at. So I'll let you take it from there. Um, I think they're getting there, but I do think the Jags are, they're back. Like, I think they're back. They're improving every week. Um, it started to get questionable, but I said this last episode too. The first few weeks of football are just so misleading. Like, weeks four and five are really when we get, you know, the true story of a team. And I think with the Jags, they're picking up now. They honestly won by more than what the score says, like you said, against the hottest team in the AFC to that point, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and I think the playmakers, they showed up finally, right? ETN was struggling early on in the season. Receivers were having problems, obviously getting the feed in, even with drops too. Uh, the defense was inconsistent. But in this game, Christian Kirk, great game. Calvin Ridley, great game. ETN was a monster. Defense, back-to-back weeks where they make plays that ultimately help this team win games. I mean, and I'll talk about T-Law too. I mean, he can make the elite plays. Like, he really can. His placement in the back of the end zone is just so impressive. Uh, And I was going to talk about that third down too. I mean, that sideline throw to Ridley was an incredible throw and it was a ballsy throw too. I mean, that, that was the moment of the game for me because not many QBs, I mean, there are QBs that can hit that, but in that scenario and in that situation, a lot of QBs are going to fold under pressure like that. T-Law didn't fold. I I think that was an incredible throw. And I think it is his best play of the season to this point. Oh, Um, yeah. And I, I also the run defense fantastic in this game James Cook and you know was pretty was pretty efficient up to that point and they pretty much shut him down so I think overall yeah I think the Jags are back this is definitely like I think it's a sign of things to come that they're getting better every single week um yeah I'm impressed by the Jags I'm comfortable putting them up on that pedestal yeah so for those who don't know that pedestal for me is Super Bowl so uh, like if yeah so I'm glad you're maybe on that with me. I, I'm sure the fans and other people in the media won't be, but I I think this is a team that can do it. They just showed you they could do it against one of the best teams in the AFC, a team that they probably would see in January. Um, so yeah, watch out for the Jags, fellas. Watch out for the Jags. All right, let's go to picks. Yeah, this one was a quick yeah, it was a quick recap. So let's go into picks. Uh I'm I'll spoil a little bit, you can recap it, but rough week for for me, fellas. Rough week. Yeah, so actually fans, fans won the week uh, going nine and five. Uh, I came in second, eight and six, and Goop went six and eight. So right now me and fans are tied (laughs) at 50, and (laughs) you're at 51. Fellas, I think that might be my worst week I think we've ever, that we've had. There was a week. No, you've done worse. You had like, 
There wasn't what? there a three and ten week maybe? There, yeah, you went like there three was. Three. Okay, so yes, it's the second worst week. Yes, I think I've only been under five hundred. You know, like yeah, once. I think it was that, and then now this. This was a bad one. Man, LA was right there. Oh, I really like. I'll tell you the two I regret because you were talking. We were talking about it earlier. I didn't tell you. I regret LA, or I don't regret LA. Like I just wish they would have executed. I'm mad about the New Orleans one because I was t- I was telling it on the episode yeah. plus one right it was always kind of towards that spread you get minus three at home so I really regret that one and, and I was telling you remember the last time they played it the same kind of vibe yeah, right New, New Orleans, Orleans dominated it. so um but I don't regret Houston uh, I think that really just ended up at the wire right and Atlanta kind of knocked it through but yeah uh, those two I definitely regret but hey we move um. Do you want to do you want to do our infamous game first or do you want to just go Thursday? Nah, we'll, we'll we'll get to it. We'll get All to right. it. Uh just to just to leave the viewers hanging for a little bit. You got to <laughs> got to stick with us to get there. Absolutely. Um, we'll go to Broncos Chiefs. Thursday night football. I don't think this episode's going to be up when this game happens, most likely. So, uh if you're seeing this, I'm saying the Chiefs. <laughs> um I mean, the Chiefs. The Chiefs have continued to just cement themselves as a force to be reckoned with, obviously they had that kind of like a blip on the radar in that season opener against the lions. They're back at home on a short week this week, took down the Vikings. Literally what reason have the Broncos given us to believe in any sort of way (laughs) that they are going to end this streak to Kansas city. The Broncos have never beaten Patrick Mahomes. They're fresh off of losing to, you know, a familiar faces. Um, You lose to Nathaniel Hackett. You lose to Vic Fangio. You lose to Josh McDaniels, you know, I mean, hopefully, hopefully the Broncos don't let themselves get embarrassed again on national TV, but give me, give me KC. This is pretty easy. Yeah. Again, I don't know why we keep getting Denver on primetime, but um, let me, let me throw you this. You'll be watching this when, you know, we have already picked KC. We add one to the score, Uh, but yeah, I think they've won 15 straight times. So, you know, again, as Shrikar mentioned, nothing to really go on. Um, Denver's trying to ship everybody, right? They're definitely going to be sellers at this trade deadline. They need picks. Uh, you know, uh, Albert Breer, I was watching him today, talked a lot about that. And I completely agree, right? You're, you're just kind of in this, like, you're stuck, but you need to get out of that. And that's how you do it. So KC in an easy one. All right, moving on, heading back overseas this week, uh, going to London for another AFC matchup. And, uh, would you look at that? The Jaguars are not playing in it. It's the Ravens <laughs> and the Titans. I'll let you start here. Yeah, they just really want me to get up at 6.30. Like, come on, man. Okay, well, yeah, so it's Ravens, Titans, uh, two teams that obviously from that COVID or area had a big little time rivalry in the playoffs. Um, this one is a little bit interesting, but I'm, I'm really glad Pittsburgh beat Baltimore there. Obviously hate both teams, but now the AFC North, there's a little bit, right? Like there's still a chance, okay, for, you know, but didn't want a little bit of a gap there. But I think Baltimore is going to move to four and two here. Uh, Give me the, give me the Ravens. Yeah. So Vegas, Vegas likes the Ravens here by three and a half points. I think that sounds like a safe bet. I mean, the Ravens have more guys capable of taking over games offensively, starting with Lamar Jackson. Unfortunately, we saw Lamar kind of blow it against the Steelers this past weekend. Uh, It's not entirely his fault. The receivers kind of sold him like completely um but, pick bad. but yeah i mean uh, lamar is not at his mvp level right now but you never know when he's going to come to play the titans i mean they <clears throat> they haven't been efficient throwing the ball on offense but they i mean they rank among the better teams in yards per pass attempt and explosive plays so i gotta give that to them um i i think you could this is kind of like a coin flip to me to be honest like i this is this is a game where I could see the Titans stealing, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go in my gut. I'll go in my gut. I'll, I'll go Baltimore here. Uh, I I feel like Baltimore is just kind of they're kind of overrated. It doesn't mean they're bad. They're not. They're not a great team. I think they're a good team. It's just how it is. I, I'll, I'll go with the Ravens. I feel like this is a game they're going to win. Moving on here, Vikings at Bears. Look, man, uh, are are the Bears back? <laughs> I'm kidding. They're they're not. But I mean, can the Vikings go on the road here and beat the Bears? With the way Chicago's defense has played most of the season, yes, absolutely they can. Um, <laughs> and right now, Vegas likes the Vikings by three in this game. They're on the road. 
I'm I'm kind of buying this Bears offensive burst recently, especially after you know they put up 40 points on a Commanders defense whose front you know really gives teams fits, right? So as of right now, I think I might take the Bears here in a slight upset. You know me, this is one that could change, but <laughs> honestly, like I I feel like they could do it at home, but it's also the Bears, so I don't know. Uh, I was full on going Chicago here and uh, like, I, I'm not saying it's, it's not going to be close, but, um, and it's not even that I'm buying into the hype. I'm just very confused where Minnesota goes here without JJF. Like, I, I think like, this is like, it's, it's going to be hard to adjust right off the bat. Um, I mean, here's, here's where I think they can get them though. I think they really do need to establish the run game. They really haven't like against inferior run teams like Carolina, uh, they were able to establish the run. Uh, I'm forgetting who they played in week three, but like Madison also had like 90, uh, 90 yards on, uh, on that team. I'm, I'm, oh, LA. Yeah. So yeah, two man. teams that don't have, you know, really good run defense, they could run the ball on them. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, uh, the same kind of thing here with Chicago. So that's going to be the key to success. Right. Um, but you know, Chicago has been kind of clicking, like it's, it's been good to see. So, uh, and it's because they're using DJ more in space. Like, I think that's been a big thing. Uh, so I'm taking Chicago here, but uh, you're right. This one is definitely a 50, 50. Uh, obviously I think if Jefferson played, I would have taken Minnesota here, but it makes things a little interesting for sure. All right. Commanders Falcons. I mean, this is, this is one of those games that you don't really love from a picks perspective because the commanders and Falcons have been two of the more unpredictable teams in the NFL so far this season. What do you got? Uh, I'm taking Atlanta and uh, the commanders, yeah, like Howells look good and bad. He's been a roller coaster ride. So have the Commanders in general. And uh, Atlanta at home, man, they just they play to their strengths. They do what they do. Yeah, the Commanders, you know, they've put forth some really explosive games on offense this season, but they've also put up some total duds. Um, and last Thursday, they had a home game against the Bears, and they just they got absolutely whacked. Right. So the Falcons <laughs> are favored in this one by two and a half. Um, and another interesting note, Desmond Ritter versus Sam Howell. So you get two quarterbacks from that 2022 draft. I like the way Atlanta's defense has stepped up. Um, I like the way Ryan Nielsen's been calling that defense recently. And I think the defense will give them the edge in this one. So give me Atlanta. Moving on here, Seahawks and Bengals. Um, the Seahawks are making you know their return from an early bye week at maybe the worst possible time and usually i love teams coming off of a bye week because you know they're fresh but i really hate this for seattle i mean they're a west coast team traveling to cincinnati and the bengals just had their get right game right i mean that offense was back jamar chase wasn't angry after the game um as a matter of fact he probably couldn't have been happier i mean you score three touchdowns get 19 targets he said he's always open and it seemed like he was always open this game should honestly be pretty good, though. I don't know if the Bengals are are back back or if we should be expecting more of the struggles we saw from them in previous weeks. But if I'm going off my logic, weeks four and five, man, they're they're always you know they're always telling. And I also just generally don't like West Coast teams coming east and playing in that early slot. So I'm gonna ride this Bengals wave for another week. Give me Cincy. I completely disagree with you on the bye week take. I think this came at the absolute best time for Seattle. They had so many O linemen injured and they needed them to get right. They needed the bye for that. And not only that, you get extra time to heal up and rest. Big deal you're traveling on the road. It's it's worse when you're traveling six hours after just playing, not when you're off a week. And I think this is the best time to travel to the East Coast when you have that bye week. And to get healthy for this type of matchup, Seattle is a well-coached team. They play really well off bye weeks. I'm taking Seattle here. Uh, I All actually right. think Seattle pulls off the upset. Um, and they match up pretty well with Cincinnati. They've got two really good corners, one who's playing out of his mind, right, and De uh, Devin Witherspoon. And I think that offense matches up well with Cincinnati, who, sure, it looks like a get-right game, but it was close. They were down four, and it really just came down to Arizona shooting themselves in the foot with two turnovers. So was it really a get-right game? Like, sure, Jamar Chase has his 12 catches and his 15 catches, but who who's Arizona's number one corner, right? Like, it, it it's just nowhere near the level, I think, that Seattle has in their secondary. So, yeah, I'm taking Seattle in an upset here. All right. 
there we go. Niners Browns. I, I just said that I don't like West Coast teams coming into that early window. But uh, I just don't know if that's really going to matter at all for the Niners. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you start here. I know you have some stuff you want to say, but what do you got? I do, man. So uh, let me just start off by saying the last NFL game I have been to was with this guy. Uh, and it was Browns Niners 2019. Yes, I know it's been that long. I go to every Cal game, but NFL wise, I've just not been to one in a minute, man. And uh, I remember I was like, what, we were like 16. I remember I was like worried about wearing the Browns jersey to the game. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, obviously we got like a little th jokes thrown at me in the section because it was a 31 to three debacle. And I actually ended up watching the game last night, dude. And uh, it was like, just, it was so frustrating. I don't even remember when Callaway dropped it in the end zone and ended up being picked. I rewatched that. I was so pissed. Um, just so many things that like, you know, nowadays, if I was watching it the way I do now, I'd be like, what the hell are we doing? Uh, because there were a lot of things that did work and a lot of things that didn't. Um, let me just start off by saying, I think in the three years that we've done this podcast, this is the worst matchup the Browns have had. I'm not even playing. I think this is dead ass the worst matchup the Browns have ever played in these three years. Uh, this is the easiest pick of my life. I usually like will pick Cleveland sometimes when I shouldn't, right? There is absolutely no way I'm picking Cleveland here. This is SF by like a million. This is SF guaranteed. This is SF like 35 to 10. Um, yeah, man. Jealous that you get to go to the game, but dude, this is nowhere close. Like... I, I will sit up here and say, I've picked the Browns in some spots they shouldn't. No way am I picking them in this game. SF. All right. Classic Goop with his Niners by a bill. All right. It's not like I didn't expect that. Um, Bro, this is like a gimme. Yeah, I mean, this is a team that just blew out Dallas. Um, I mean, I think there are a lot of factors that, you know, are going the Niners way here. Obviously, Watson not practicing. Miles Garrett not practicing. Yeah, I'm just not sure that Damn. they're going to keep up with this Niners team. What's the line? Dynamic? The line? Yeah. Oh, What's oh, the oh, the spread. I haven't looked at it, but I think it's Niners minus four and a half. So they're giving they're giving the Browns a little bit of slack here. Do you want to, do you want to mention the Jim Schwartz stats, or do you want me to? I thought you were going to do it because you sent me the tweet. I can I can can I mention it real quick before you? Okay, yeah. So it is it is no, it's uh, Niners minus eighteen. No, I'm just kidding. It's there's not, like an it's al literally there's not. like an al there's like an alternate line here. Why why is it? It's like minus eighteen plus three ninety. But honestly, I would take that. That's plus odds. You guys can get a free plus three ninety there. Okay, it's um, S it's SF minus seven. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that's three points with the dog. So too. Ha hammer the <laughs> ha ha hammer the spread basically. You're telling me they're saying SF's only gonna win by a touchdown? Are you kidding me, dude? Yeah, bro. Especially That's with the news of the the practice and the injury. Like, why? Nah, nah. How no, no. Okay, I'll, I'll read it real quick. Let me read it real quick. Um, Yeah, so Kyle Shanahan has faced Jim Schwartz uh, eight times. Shanahan is 0-8 in those matchups, and his offense has scored over 20 points just once. What was, the, uh, what was the most recent matchup against Jim Schwartz? Oh, probably like a Philly game. Okay. Because that's when he last coached, but um, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I mean, this Niners team is too dynamic on offense, too dominant on defense. I mean, this I, the Niners are going to pull away here. So give me the Niners. In the infamous Niners-Browns game, we are both going SF. We're not going to see this for another four years, man. So, yeah. You know, we gotta, we gotta I, I don't know. This. I think this is just so cool that, you know, we finally, like, because especially because, you know, Browns and Niners will never see it. Like, you know, I'll tell you this, like, so the last time we went to the game together, the last time before that, I was still in middle school and Manziel was our quarterback. So this is how different parts of my life it's been. It's been middle school, high school, and college. I I, I don't know. I think that's so cool. But Hey, and I'll, I'll throw a name out there for the viewers out there. Remember this guy, Isaiah Crowell, uh, had a great game in that one as well. I, a lot of people forgot about him. Isaiah Crowell, he was, he was a beast there. Moving on, Panthers at Dolphins. Yeah, the unfortunate reality for the Panthers this week is that they're probably getting absolutely wrecked. I mean, they're 0-5. The reality right now is that they're sending the number one pick in the draft to the Bears. We'll see how much that changes over the course of the next 13 weeks, but, I mean, they are staring 0-6 directly in the face. 
Miami just has too many weapons on offense. Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle, Raheem Mostert and, and Devon A. Chan out of the backfield. I mean, those four have been incredible recently. The Dolphins are averaging the most points per game in the NFL, most yards per game in the NFL. So, yeah, uh, give me the Dolphins in a blowout. This, this is not getting me close. I think this is where I'll own up to. So, you know, I, I hyped the Panthers up a lot in the offseason, and uh, I, it kind of died down when I saw some of the injuries that they had, but I still nowhere near expected them to be the worst team in the league. Nowhere near. So I'll, you know, I'll take my, uh, I'll, you know, tip my cap there. I, I was wrong, I guess. But the reason I was, I guess, maybe wrong, but I, I said this too. They made a massive mistake not taking Strata. I said that the second Bryce was picked, uh, you obviously can be a witness to that. Like, I, th- I thought he was a perfect fit with Frank Reich. And look, the problem with Bryce is there's just a limitation. Can't see over the middle of the field. Red zone offense has been awful, right? And, uh, you know, their bright spot has been Adam Thielen, who obviously you guys know I love. So, you know, at least kudos that he's doing well. But yeah, this is going to be Miami. Um, they match up super well, too fast. Miami. Yeah, I also kind of have to bite the bullet on Carolina. I switched last second. My division pick was originally the Panthers, and I switched to the Saints before the season started. But yeah, I'm with you. I didn't expect the Panthers to be this bad. Moving on here, the Colts and the Jaguars. I mean, this could be the game of the week, to be honest, in in Jacksonville. Who you got? Um, We just talked about the Jaguars. They improve every week. The Colts, very well coached. They're going to be with Gardner Minshew in this game, who I think is honestly better at this point for this Colts team than Anthony Richardson. Yeah, we got. I mean, no, no, no. I'm saying, I'm saying, like, right now, like he is the better quarterback. Like, I would still probably disagree with that, but I'm going to take Jacksonville here. And uh, look, it's Minshew versus former team. That's cool vibes. But I can't remember the last time Indy's beaten Jacksonville at Jacksonville. It's been like a really long time. Um, obviously I thought Wentz would end that streak and I was unfortunately wrong <laughs> back in that day. Um, but yeah, they match up super well. Um, Indy is still a really good team. Like what? I think they're three and two, right? Like this is still a team that actually could be fighting for a wild card spot. I mean, but yeah, Anthony Richardson being out for the next four games, I guess kind of, you know, like Minshew's, I think one of the best backups, if not the best backup in the league. So, you know, it's really good that he's there and I think he fits Shane Steichen's offense pretty well. Uh, and I, again, Josh Downs, who was my receiver five, I believe in the draft, I was really high on him. Uh, you know, I think the sky's the limit for him in this offense. So I think it'll be a little bit closer, but uh, I'm still take Jacksonville here. Yeah. The Colts are three and two. The Jaguars are also three and two and they're favored in this game by four and a half points. Um, obviously winning two games in London Sunday was an impressive win over the bills. The Colts got a big performance out of Zach Moss. The Jaguars got a big game from Travis Etienne. I mean, after playing well in their uh, in their second home, I wouldn't be shocked to see the Jags in a in a true homecoming here. Uh, you know, give their fans reason to be excited. I mean, it's a big divisional matchup. I think they're going to answer to the call here. So give me the Jags. Moving on, the Saints and the Texans. The Saints are coming off of one of the most impressive wins uh, of the week. Really, I mean, they took this team, this Pats team to the cleaners, right? Going into New England and shutting them out 34, nothing. I mean, that was one of the games that we said it, we we were really wrong about that. I mean, I I felt the Patriots would get up for a home game, but that didn't end up being the case at all. Stroud and, you know, this Texans team, they were rolling a little bit. um, And then obviously that Atlanta game happened. That Falcons defense is being run by a former Saints disciple and Ryan Nielsen, uh, Ryan Nielsen. So New Orleans has to feel good about the way they could match up in this particular case. Vegas likes the Saints by one and a half in these uh, in these lines. But if this game gets to be a defensive battle, I think it plays pretty heavily into the favor of New Orleans. So, yeah, g- g- give me the Saints here. I'm not I'm not making the mistake I did last week. Going to go with New Orleans. Yeah, I'm taking the Saints, uh, and it's mainly just because they match up super well with Houston. I, I think their corners match up great with Houston's receivers. And it wasn't like – yeah, it's it's so weird to say because I don't think Stroud had a bad game, right? Like, he didn't. It, it's just Falcons making key plays. And obviously, Stroud actually did technically get the game-winning drive, but they just had another game-winning drive on top of it. So, 
you know, um, kudos to Desmond Ritter, who looked, that was his best game of his career by far. Uh, I think no if hands Easily. about that. Um, Kyle Pitts got involved. Drake London got involved. They finally utilized their skill positions. So, um, you know, that was more on Atlanta, good Atlanta rather than bad Houston. Uh, this, I just think, is a New Orleans, uh, you know, good matchup here. All right, Pats Raiders. Josh McDaniels going up against Bill Belichick. I mean, may have sounded nice few years ago now it's not really that good um yeah i i feel like this is a pretty terrible game but for picks it's feeling a bit easier to project for me but i want to see who you got first this is like i i think this one's actually the toughest one i i again like if if the pats could match up with anybody right now i actually think it would be the raiders um but uh, and it's like belichick versus a former coach he doesn't lose those type of games, but the Raiders at home have been, or at least, you know, this is really tough, man. I, I'm going to take the Raiders, but I'm really not confident in this one. I, I think this one is the hardest one to pick. Yeah, the Raiders, you know, they feel like a team whose future is very uncertain at this point, and they're kind of stuck in neutral, kind of like teams like the Broncos and teams like the Giants. They make a lot of off-season headlines, but they aren't really a threat to do much during the actual games. Uh, like I said, this game is going to be terrible. The Raiders are favored at home by two and a half. Sounds about right, to be honest. I'll, I'll also go with LV here, but yeah, I'm with you. I think this is a pretty pretty interesting game in the sense that for picks, it's a little bit weird. Another game that's a little bit interesting for picks, Cardinals and Rams. The Rams were on pace to put up 28 points against the Eagles this past week, but their offense completely stalled out in the second half. And by stalled out, I mean they were shut out. The Cardinals are another team that feels more dangerous than their record. They're 1-4 and four this season, but they've given teams some fits, some good teams at that. And they have some skilled players playing really well right now too. Rondell Moore, Michael Wilson, Marquise Brown. They've made some big plays in the last handful of weeks. So this matchup is, uh, I think it's pretty underrated. And I think it's a fun matchup to watch this week. A lot of young, exciting talent offensively. It's in LA. I think I'm going to side with the Rams here. But again, just in Cardinals fashion, I wouldn't be surprised if they made this game, you know, pretty close, like one score. Yeah, it's funny. I think like out of all the division teams, like obviously the Rams have been, you know, kind of destroyed by SF. They give Seattle fits. But Arizona also gives them fits too. So it's kind of funny to, you know, take this matchup up. But I think in terms of personnel wise, the Rams who don't have the greatest defensive roster, this is a good matchup for them though. Uh, So give me the Rams here. All right. Eagles Jets. The Eagles are 5-0 this season, which is obviously impressive. They are a great team and will be a factor all throughout the playoffs. Um, So who you got in this one in New York? I think it's going to be a lot closer than people think. I really do. Uh, Like, so the Jets have now played, right? Two, I think, of everyone's top five teams or top, right? Like, Buffalo's got to be in your maybe top five, top six, right? Kansas City's got to be up there. And they beat Buffalo and and low-key should have, like, 50-50, right? Should have beaten KC, right? Uh, Now they're playing another team in that type of spectacle. I think this is going to be a lot closer than people think. I'm going to go with Philly, though. I'm not going to make the mistake of picking against them, but... Um, yeah, this is uh, a game that I actually think could go down to the, to the wire. It all depends on if they can get past that run defense. It's super stout, but the Jets won last week mainly because of Brees Hall. They're going to need to do it again. It's, it's going to be tough, right? You're going from like one of the worst run defenses in the league to the absolute best. So maybe second to the Browns, but I'll give Philly the edge. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be all that close. I mean, here's what I'll say. Beating the Broncos – getting revenge for Sean Payton's comments about Nathaniel Hackett. That was the Jets Super Bowl up to this point, right? Um, it, oh, I think I, it'll, I, let's be real. Cause I've, I've seen so many posts about it. I mean, yeah, it, it, that's the high point of the Jets here. I mean, it will take a big, big effort to beat the Eagles unless they can force a bunch of mistakes by Philly's offense and maybe create three or four turnovers. I think the Eagles are going to improve to six and zero. Oh. So does Vegas. Eagles are six and a half point favorites. I think they'll cover that. So give me Philly here. Lions and Bucks. 
this got flexed into the afternoon, and I think this is one of uh, the best matchups of the slate. It's in Tampa Bay. The Bucks are a surprising 3-1 and one so far this season, and they're coming off their bye. And the Lions are obviously riding high as well. I mean, the Lions can beat you with their running game, their pass game, the defense. Like It doesn't matter, right? Their only loss so far this season came in overtime in a pretty tough game against Seattle. They've scored 31 or more in three of their last four games. But if we look at what Vegas is saying, there's actually a pretty substantial level of respect for the Bucks right now. The Lions are only favored by three. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see just what type of team the Bucks are coming off of a bye playing at home and taking on one of the most balanced and explosive offenses in the league. So I'm going to take Detroit, but I would not be <laughs> surprised if the Bucks do something here. I mean, this is their creamsicle Jersey game, right? Like, bro, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll chalk that up. Like you can't lose in those. Right. I mean, but give me Detroit, give me Detroit. It's been hyped up the, like the Bucks matchup just for him to be like, Nope, I'm going to take Detroit. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, I'm taking Detroit too. And the reason for that is, um, I, again, I, I think this is just a bad matchup for Tampa. Like, Detroit is just better than them. They have more talent. Uh, I think that's the problem here. Uh, never discount it at Tampa. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, they're, it's definitely a group that can win. Um, you know, the Baker vibes have been great this year. He comes in to watch the Sooner game day and they upset Texas. So, you know, maybe Baker's just on the right side of the coin this uh, this football season. But uh, I, I think Detroit wins this one. If if not, if Baker wins this one, I think this is a real legit win. And I think the Bucks got to stamp themselves on the map in the sense that like, yo, this could be, you know, not just a, a, a you know, a sneaky division winner, but like, yo, they could win one or maybe even two playoff games. Unfortunately for the rest of America and for me and you, we got to watch the Giants on national TV once again. <laughs> It's the Giants and the Bills on Sunday Night Football in Buffalo. Who you got? The Battle of New York, uh, where Shrikar is going to be located at, except he'll be in Cleveland for the Niner game. Um, Yeah, man. Wow. You're telling me Buffalo, after an angry loss, gets New York at home on Sunday night for their schedule? Like, could that be more kind? Like, could, could the schedulers have been nicer? to Josh Allen and the Bills. I mean, like, this is like, hey guys, I know you just lost to T-Law. Here's a free gimme. Here's like literally a free win. Giants are falling apart, man. And, and like, it's like a crazy great matchup. Uh, obviously, you know, I, I don't know when Trey White tore his Achilles, but prayers to him. I can't remember if it was Jags game or the week before, but I don't know if we talked about that. Hopefully Saquon comes back for this game so that it doesn't go 63 to nothing. Maybe it's like 63 to 10. Uh, also, Daniel Jones, I, I think I defended him last week, but we never brought it out. So again, as much as you know, it is look at what this man is dealing with on the O line. I remember I ranted for like two minutes on the last episode. So I'll save you guys the trouble. Worst O line I've seen in a long time. Buffalo is going to dominate. I think the Giants O line is the worst O line I've ever seen, period. Um, yeah, this Bills team is kind of like, really like Jekyll and Hyde. I mean, you beat the you beat the brakes off the Dolphins two weekends ago. Then you go to London and get beat by the Jaguars. Like, what am I supposed to expect? But I think for this matchup, even as familiar as Brian Dable and Joe Shane are with the Bills, yeah, Buffalo's going to come back and pretty much just take out their frustration on this Giants team. <laughs> and uh, they're 14 and a half point favorites. And I think I'd still, I'd still cover that. So. <laughs> Uh, That's crazy. Yeah, B- Bills in a blowout. Moving on, Monday Night Football, the Cowboys and the Chargers. Yeah, the Cowboys obviously crushing defeat this past week. Um, you stay in California, and you match up with Kellen Moore, who left Dallas during the offseason. Um, I mean, Dallas is going to have to bounce back, and the way they're going to do it is literally by getting pressure on Justin Herbert. That is how you're going to win this game. So the odds are actually saying the Cowboys are favorites here by a field goal, but with the way they played against the Niners and the chargers are coming off a bye, I'm going to go with LA. Um, I'm not, I'm not too confident in it, but because it's, it's also going to be a Cowboys home game. Let's, let's get that right. But yeah, give me the, give me the chargers here. 
Chargers have been hanging by a thread a little bit on some of their wins. Um, I think this is a game Dallas like really wants to to win to show the world, hey, we're not a bad team. Uh, I actually do think LA matches up well with them though. Their O line's been really good, right? Uh, and Dallas, uh, you know, is a good pass rush. But I think the key here is Dallas needs to blitz, and they need, to, as you said, you get pressure on Justin Herbert. Obviously, it's uh, like if Trayvon Diggs was here, I'm te- like I think that is probably the biggest blow any team has suffered so far, aside from Aaron Rodgers, obviously. But like, like I think non quarterback blow, I think Trayvon Diggs is probably the biggest one, or Nick Chubb, one of those two. But um, yeah, that one is huge for Dallas. I don't think people realize that. Um, like, I think if Trayvon Diggs was here, this would be easy pick, but I'm going to pick Dallas anyway. I think they bounce back here. Um, but yeah, LA honestly does match up well with them. So this will be interesting. I I just do. I've been saying this. I think LA has just been hanging by a thread though. So, yeah. All right. That wraps things up. We differ on one. Wow. Two Two. games. Wow. Okay. Again, it's me taking the road teams and you taking the home teams. It's always (laughs) that. I think it's literally always that. It's always that. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. No, I'm looking at it. Yep. (laughs) It's always that. Well, yeah, we'll see how it fares this week. But uh, yeah, man, uh, I was really excited for this episode because the Niners played the Browns. So you'll probably catch me next week ranting about somehow we got a lead and then we blew it because of some stupid thing that PJ Walker or whoever the hell is starting for us, uh, whatever he does in the third quarter. But uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. We've been the Cold Our Truth NFL podcast. We'll see you guys next time.